There's a, there's a root assumption, I think, in healing culture that says uh, you have to own your triggers and any emotional response that you have is your own responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is one of the things that comes up in the training with Gabor Mate, which exactly. was one of the, the big sticking points between me and him. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, the problem with this assertion, I mean, there's many problems with this assertion, but I think <laughs> one of the main problems with an assertion like that one, saying like, well, you have to own your triggers because your emotional responses are only your responsibility. I can see the appeal of that because it gives, the, it puts the control back in your hands to some extent. So like, well, if I'm just, if I just gaslight myself hard enough, right, I can pretend right? That these responses really are just a matter of me growing and healing and, you know, owning my triggers and figuring out what happened to me that I respond in a certain way when I'm faced with that particular situation. And that is kind of like the perfect, the perfect, perfect situation for kind of like this neoliberal consumerist capitalist culture. you did you get the consent uh, yes request yeah <laughs> you consent to being recorded and anything yeah. you can anything you say may be used against you definitely i am aware <laughs> of that <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's interesting navigating the digital landscape of today where you know like that's like literally the thing like everything that you say will be used against you at some point by someone particularly if you're more in the public spotlight yeah yeah something i've noticed over the past few years is my uh my kind of uh social imprint has grown on the net um you have to kind of deal with a lot of stuff along the way uh you become a really good screen for other people's projections like the the what do they call it the parasocial relationship yes. is a, is a real thing. It is. Yeah. Parasociality <clears throat> is powerful. What did you say? No, parasociality is very powerful. Parasociality, yeah. Yeah. So okay, I'm with uh, Aaron Aronovich. Yeah. How did I do with your last name? Did I pronounce yeah, it's fine. okay? Yeah. Aronovich hey. is a is a acceptable iteration of it. Okay. Well, give me the real thing. Well, I mean, if you were to say it like in proper Hebrew, then uh, the R becomes more of a guttural uh, sound. Aronovich. Like, like, Aronovich, like a, uh, like a, like a French. Uh. Yeah, Aronovich. so I went a little hard with the guttural R, Aronovich, which yeah. is <laughs> something, you know, if you speak uh, Quebecois French, the guttural is really pronounced. So, right, yes. Yeah. <laughs> So whenever I translate, in, like when I try to speak some uh, Hebrew words, it comes out like really strong. But it's it feels good to do it, like chala, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I love the the strong uh, and the uh, and the uh. Yeah, they're sort of like nice nice sounds that we don't need to really have in many other languages. Yeah, it's good exercise for the tongue, I think, and it's good for English people to learn something of other languages. I think it helps make the English a little more um, musical, maybe. Mm -hmm. Definitely. You know? And so, okay, where are you from? Because I, I, it's a, I hear a Spanish accent, and I know like you're living in Mexico now. So tell yeah. us a little bit about your background, yeah? Yeah, I mean, I was born here in Mexico. I was born in Mexico City uh, in the early 80s. My parents were Mexican. My grandparents are Mexican. Uh, four generations up, like the generation above my grandparents, nobody is Mexican. So everybody, everybody comes from uh, Central Europe and Eastern Europe, uh, mostly Jewish refugees. They were fleeing Europe in between the world war period some of them before some of them after but roughly around that time and you know as many european jews or european refugees in general everybody was headed out of europe whatever they could land uh hopefully the united states or canada but sometimes for whatever reason or destiny the united states or canada wouldn't take more refugees for the day or they would divert ships to other ports in uh, south america or latin america so, you know, different different stories. Each person obviously has a full, incredible story. But most of my, all of my ancestors arrived in Mexico for, you know, reasons of, I guess, <laughs> arbitrary arbitrary reasons, more or less. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was born in Mexico City. But then when I was 12 or 13, we moved out of Mexico in 
uh, we went to Tel Aviv. Well, close to Tel Aviv, a small town just north of Tel Aviv in Israel. And that's where I grew up most of my teenage mm -hmm. years and my um, young adulthood. And I went to university there and pretty much, you know, the, 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 the important, let's say, developmental stages, at least the ones that I was more cognizant of, happened in Israel. So I guess culturally, culturally, I'm probably a mix, but much more so Israeli than Mexican. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that. And for people uh, who aren't familiar with you and your work, can you give, give us a little brief introduction on the kind of work that you do? Like you're a PhD candidate and so give us a little bit of that background. Right. So um, I mean, it's, it's <laughs> that's, that's a good question, actually. Maybe it helps me also like order these things in my mind. But, you know, for, for a few years, I lived in the rainforest in Peru, which is where you and I met at an ayahuasca retreat center, where I originally went there to work for the nonprofit that was attached to the center that was kind of like a very short lived. Very quickly, I transitioned more into research positions. I had like a few different collaborations with research groups and organizations within the broader psychedelic scene and it was a good opportunity to gather some data and do some projects and so on and so forth so um, um i was mostly doing interviews with people after finishing the retreats right like you you would you would lead or teach in a retreat and then whether it was a 12th day or a 21 day and then after the retreat was done i would sit with them for an hour and a half, an hour and a half and can I get in their own words what the retreat was like for them? What were the benefits or lack of benefits to the experience? And what did they attribute those benefits to? Mm -hmm. Right. There's kind of like a when I guess for me at least, it was kind of like an assumption in the beginning that ayahuasca would be the central piece of an ayahuasca retreat, which you know makes total sense. And you know, that is still true to some extent, but I start as I was interviewing people, I started figuring out that. Uh, many of the things that were actually very impactful for people that were like really life changing and transformative in also different ways weren't necessarily the experiences that they were having just in ceremony, but other things that were part of the container or that workshop, particularly the social component of it, the relationships that they forge, the sense of communitas that oftentimes arises um, in the context of a workshop. Right, the, there's a, there's a process. You probably know this word, hormesis, which is a sort of uh, resilience that happens after we go to through difficult experiences. And this is something that there's many different spiritual techniques or technologies that rely on that principle, right? Like the temascal or the different sweat lodges or the different initiations that involve pain or discomfort and so on and so forth. So hormesis right. is kind of like that idea of putting yourself. Uh, purposefully in uncomfortable or you know painful situations and then uh getting through them and gaining like that sense of accomplishment resilience so on and so forth so yeah you know the feeling of like thank god i'm alive right you know it gives yes. you a kind of uh mental health boost yeah. right I, I had a few of those experiences after ceremonies where like it was just like a massive amount of gratitude for making it through and being you know on the other side uh but there's something else that happens through that process of hormesis when these experiences are shared right mm -hmm. when the container is socially to the extent that you know in you know you probably have noticed this also through your own work but you know people arriving as strangers and then going through these very powerful experiences that are very emotionally charged and then doing that together and then there's a sense of communion like that sense of communitas that was defined by Victor Turner, right? The shared togetherness uh, that happens when people go through these experiences together. And then it is not uncommon, right? That after 12 days or 21 days, people that came in as total strangers, because of the context in which they met and forged that connection, they become like really, really close and intimate mm -hmm. with each other. Um, so, you know, I, I shifted my approach, not necessarily about ayahuasca as kind of like an isolated category, the void of context, but rather about like really understanding the importance of context, particularly the social container. And then that was kind of like my focus for most of the time that I was there, both as a researcher, but also as a facilitator. Mm -hmm. like when I was facilitating the workshops myself, then a lot of the things that I really wanted to stress was 
the things that I felt were oftentimes being left out. I mean, we're going to get much more in depth because that's the focus also of the articles that you wrote uh, in the sense of what is the focus of these workshops for the most part, right? But within that, there's also the other side, which is what are the things that are left out? And yeah. what I what I what I thought was being left out consistently and um, to the detriment of people was particularly that idea or realization that actually individual health is not only reliant on like the individual person doing the work, but if we wanted to really be happy and healthy, then we started to we needed to start paying much more attention to the intrinsic links between the health of individuals and the health of communities and the health of individuals and the health of societies and, you know, expanding out the health of the individual and the health of culture, right, that kind of like nourishes and provides the context for that individual in all sorts of different ways. And then, of course, uh, you know, the link between individual health and environmental health and all of these different things that oftentimes get invisibilized when the narrative is exclusively hyper individualized say so like well you know one of the one of the one of the mantras in this retreat center which you probably have heard many times i mean i heard this thousands of times in my time there right it's like the best gift that you can offer the world is your own personal transformation right yes this, this is kind of like the thing that is like at the root of the ideology that it's is a kind of it's a it's a distortion of uh something that carl jung said like so many things uh a lot of his he wasn't a very pithy writer, you know, so whenever I see like a very pithy quote attributed to Jung, I get really suspicious. And, I, right. you know, I have all of his works that are in electronic format so I can search for them. And more often than not, I'm unable to find any reference to his actual work. But what often happens is something gets paraphrased and kind of distilled into this uh, nice little feel good quotation. Like, yeah, the best thing you can do for the world is work on your own personal healing. Yeah, it's a trope. Right, so it's a trope. Um, you know, and I guess as, as many tropes, there's a kernel of truth in it to the extent that it's important for people to be responsible for their own well-being and so on and so forth. Yeah, but that oftentimes also kind of like obscures these other intrinsic links and the importance of actually being healthy individuals within healthy... And it's something that you wrote in one of the articles. So I was just rereading them this morning, right? Like... Um, something around along those lines right of like well what what is really what is really the point of like hyper focusing on the self when we aren't really paying attention to toxic environments and toxic cultures that can't by definition derive in healthy individuals because there's like intrinsic relationship between both so so yeah i yeah. Th started like paying more attention to that i started refocusing my interviews more on like really kind of getting the details of what people experience the social container like and it was really illuminating right like the mm -hmm. the importance that many people did place actually in relationships uh in reciprocity in that sense of mutual responsibility that arises within that context um is primary and you know it's still it's not devoid of problems i think again like one of the things that i really resonated with in in your writings was this idea that um you know one of the standard interventions in these retreats is the sharing circle right like mm. we're coming we're coming together the morning after this ceremony that it's very difficult to make sense of let alone try to english properly or put into language and we're already kind of like having this need to communicate it right and you know i started this is something that for me, for example, was very, very, very prominent, particularly during my first two years in the rainforest, where I got so much into the habit of um, thinking in terms of the structure that was being provided for the ceremonies, the context in which the ceremonies happened, and knowing that the next morning there was going to be a sharing circle. And many times I find myself in ceremony, <laughs> right, like already creating the story, like creating, yes. like, like, I'm not able to experience the experience itself because my mind is already creating the story. What is it that I'm going to communicate tomorrow to these other people? Yeah. How is this you automatically become like self, uh, self um, editing or something like, how is this going to play in the sharing circle tomorrow? Like, exactly. ooh, I better like bookmark this experience. Cause wow, this is going to yeah. really, yeah. Oh man. That's a really good point. So you notice that in yourself. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that people may not know is when we're working at, uh, well, th this particular ayahuasca center, but I know it's um, it's commonplace in other ones too, is that if you're facilitating or teaching, you're 
expected to sit in ceremony with the participants. And often there's, I experience a lot of pressure to drink ayahuasca along with the participants. And so you're expected to be there uh, as a support staff for the participants, but often you're going through your own process as well, catalyzed by drinking the ayahuasca or doing whatever else you're doing, uh, which I think um, can be good in some ways, but also quite problematic in other ways. I mean, how did you navigate that? Because you were there for like four years, right? So you probably went through a whole series of different uh, uh, changes of perception about what you're doing and all of that. So tell me a little bit about that. Well, <clears throat> you know, I think going back to what we were saying before about that phenomenon that happens when we're experiencing when we're in you know having a an experience with ayahuasca for example and then instead of actually being present for what's happening we're also we're already waving a narrative that is shareable in kind of like bite-sized digestible you know bites that can be communicated um there is uh, an overarching expectation right which is if you are facilitating workshops or you are part of this organization or you are you know, doing the work, then you're expected to also adhere to certain ideas of what this work is for. Yes. Yeah, like what, why is it that we're drinking ayahuasca for? Um, you know, and, and this, this, this answer is not value neutral. It is embedded within all sorts of different assumptions and ideological ideas of what ayahuasca is for, or what medicine is for, what psychedelics are for, so on and so forth. Yeah, and like you very eloquently expanded on in your essays, right? It's the idea that this traumatic culture really has taken over uh, the whole psychedelic scene, including the plant medicine scene that is actually rooted and embedded within Amazonian ontologies and ideas of what it means to be happy and healthy that are completely different and have nothing to do whatsoever with the ideas that we bring with us, right? Mm, yeah. Um, so, you know, as a facilitator, it's not necessarily that you're expected to drink in ceremony with the rest of the participants, but you're, you're expected to be engaging constantly and endlessly with doing the work, with kind of your own awakening and your own constant excavation of root causes and childhood traumas and always kind of like keep spinning the narrative of why you are the way that you are and like all the issues that we deal with like tracking that tracking those back down to those early childhood experiences and kind of like this endless 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 navel gazing and obsession and self-absorption with our own stories right mm -hmm. so it's very difficult to be there and like not being engaging in it because there's an expectation if you're going to be here then you also need to be doing your work and doing your work is an endless vortex of self-absorption again, because it's never ending, right? There's always gonna be another layer of the onion to peel if you're really looking for that other layer of the onion to peel. And the mind has this incredible capacity to spin stories. And it's like, it's a, there's an infinite amount of space and possibility for reshaping and rechanging the narratives and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm mean, kind of like straight a little bit away from the original question. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, for the first, I guess, two or three years, I was very much into it. I was drinking ayahuasca constantly. I was like, you know, taking every opportunity that I could to engage with the work and having conversations and the sharing circles. And I think that started to wane at some point, particularly after I became a facilitator. And, you know, some people, some facilitators will definitely be drinking like every ceremony, like different quantities, depending on what they're range is for actually being able to be of service and being helpful mm -hmm. uh for me for me that was a kind of like a line that i very rarely crossed like i knew that if i was you know in my personal capacity in my personal experience and my particular philosophy like if i was there to be of help to other people and being present for other people's experiences then uh, I wanted to be sober or at the very least, you know, like not having to deal with like my own process in the midst of like trying to be present. For, you know, there's also different rationalizations for it. Like, oh, well, I want to be in the same wavelength. I want to be connected right, to the people. Yeah. I want to be in the in the space. I mean, you know, I think like those are valid to some extent for some people. But for me, um, you know, I think this can become kind of like a rationalization for a sort of consumerism that is unhealthy but it said like basically it's available so why not yeah well one of the things that um 
actually caused me to stop pursuing working at these kind of centers. Uh, so after we met at this um, center, I experimented with leading my own retreats down in Peru. And um, I did one, a, a small retreat for men at a small non-commercial center uh, run by an Ashaninkan healer. And that was wonderful. My next experience is I co-hosted it with a fairly prominent American meditation teacher. And I had had her on the podcast and we did a, you know, a Zoom call talking about the possibility of working together. And I felt pretty good about it. But as soon as I got down to Peru and we met, I, uh, I was starting to get a lot of red flags. And one of the things that happened was uh, at that point, I was, I was at a place where um, I didn't want to drink in ceremony. Uh, I really wanted to be there for people. I felt like I was at a good place in my own process. Uh, but she was very adamant that I, I, I drink with them. And her rationale was ayahuasca is how I connect to people. And if you don't drink the ayahuasca with us, right. uh, you're not going to be connected. Right. And so then what I saw, is, and I, you know, I, I resisted and pushed back and gave my rationalization why, you know, I don't need ayahuasca to connect with people. I connect with right. people in other ways and in, you know, in sober time, like through dialogue and things. Uh, but what I saw and what I suspected was that she wanted everyone to be drinking ayahuasca so that uh, they would be more compliant with the kind of group think that uh, she was trying to foster in right. that group which was basically centered around her as a supreme healer and, and all kinds of utter nonsense. And it was a really bad experience for me. I ended up uh, abandoning it early and um, other people made like an exodus halfway through the, the retreat. Uh, it was just really, wow. really bad. And yeah. after that, I kind of, I swore off uh, leading retreats or being part of retreats. And I just wanted to focus more on being the support for people, you know, however they were going to access plant medicine. I wanted to be there for them uh, before, during, and after, uh, but not actually participate in those kind of retreats anymore. So that, that was a big wake up call to me um, about some of the things that could go very, very wrong in those situations. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds like a nightmare. It was a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> um so that's a part of it for me too is like where's that pressure coming from and uh you know like you said supporting the kind of um the the context that uh is a part of whatever center you're at like even the you know the ideas around what is ayahuasca what's the mythology around it the languaging used like yeah. ayahuasca as mother or or whatever right like you're kind of expected to buy in and support those those kind of ideas right well i mean that's 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 the i think that's one of the most important topics right that i think are very important to kind of like dive into what what is what is the narrative like what is the story what are the stories really that we tell about why ayahuasca is for what healing means and so on and so forth and how people are Prime to conform to a particular way of experiencing these things. And, you know, like one of the things that I had to deal with a lot, for example, was, um, you know, at this center, there was a very, very strong emphasis on child trauma. Yeah, you know, like the, mm -hmm. the landmark and Gabormate, you know, streams of influence that you delineated in your essay. Uh, I mean, that's 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 pretty much kind of like the ideological basis for it, right? Like the the, the, the idea that we're ultimately absolutely responsible for our own process and that we have to trace everything every this every adult dysfunction can and should be traced back to some sort of primeval original sin or or childhood trauma in more secular ways mm -hmm. um but you know as, as we know ayahuasca provides a much wider range of experiences that don't necessarily re relate to any of that so there's a very interesting thing that happens when that is a narrative that is being pushed, because on the one hand, there is a priming effect where people will be increasingly more likely to interpret, no matter what the experience is like, to twist that and interpret that in terms that adjust to that um, to, to that 
idea, right? To that uh, expectation. There's an expectation, right? That if you're doing it right and you're doing mm -hmm. your work and you're not bypassing shit and you're doing it right, right? This is kind of like a very important thing. You're doing it right. Then you need to be able to relate that experience to your childhood trauma and so on and so forth. And then sometimes it happens that you go on a completely different journey. Then there's this incredible ecstatic experience of experiences of bliss or metaphysical imaginations or philosophical wanderings or all sorts of like really powerful things that nonetheless, if you're not able to like really relate that to what the expectation is and communicate back something that relates to your personal process and your childhood trauma and how you're growing as a person, then it's pretty much seen as not really valuable or invalid or a spiritual bypass. And yeah. then there's a fr frustration that comes up. Like, oh, like, I, like I had a lot of people throughout these years that had those kinds of experiences. And then they came to me and like, you know, I'm really frustrated because it's already been three ceremonies and four ceremonies and I haven't gotten what I came here for. And then you yeah. ask, well, what, what does it mean you haven't gotten what you came here for? So, well, why I came here to heal my childhood trauma. I came here to understand more about the deeper roots of my childhood trauma. But, but, but I mean, I remember you told me about your experience and you were in ecstatic bliss and you, you know, you, there was like this expansion of your world and whatever happened. Like, yeah, I mean, that was cool, but it wasn't that. Right. Yeah. Well, it's like um, that would give someone maybe a taste of freedom that's possible right here and now if you uh, stop being so focused and obsessed with finding the roots of your childhood trauma. Like, right. It was this great thing that James Hillman said about uh, we're not so much traumatized by what happened in our experience, but how we retell the story of our childhood trauma. Absolutely. So we, can keep, we can keep re traumatizing ourselves. Um, thinking about trauma as a disconnection from present moment reality, from uh, authentic self in the moment and all of that. And there's a lot of truth to that. And so what it kind of does is it perpetuates this uh, disconnection um, by virtue. Like you said, it's kind of a, a Sisyphean project, uh, like shoveling water, totally. uh, you know, one layer down, you know, it fills up with some other narrative about what went wrong. And, um, and that to me is directly tied to the capitalistic aspect of psychedelics and psychedelic, quote unquote, healing. Absolutely. You're nodding. So tell me more. <laughs> How do you see these connections playing out? Well, I mean, I think it's important to understand that medical systems or therapeutic systems are not born in a vacuum. Uh, like medical systems, as a general rule, they are outshoots of a general cultural system. Mm -hmm. The way that we perceive what it means to be happy and healthy, or how we perceive illness or the sickness recovery process, are intimately tied with what is our general worldview, what are the cultural ideas that we have about personhood and all sorts of different agents in the world, and so on and so forth. Um, when we talk about healing culture, right? Like it's kind of like the when you were asking before about my work, I think in the last year and a half, the main project that I have is this Instagram page that began as a joke and then very quickly got, gained traction. So I start, to, I start, I needed to start being a little bit more intentional with it. It's called healing from healing, right? But the idea of it is kind of like taking healing culture as an analytical object, right? Like we, there's one thing that I felt didn't really have a term for it, but that I felt everybody knew what I was referring to when I said that healing culture right as this cultural object that we have in modern western post-industrial late stage capitalist societies that is constituted or fed by different streams of ideological or cultural ideas i think the main ones you know in many ways are kind of like new age spiritualities right that kind of became very prominent throughout um i guess the last 50 or 60 years in different evolutions of it since kind of like the country cultural revolution of the 60s, but in modern times have become much more entangled, not only with um, new age spirituality, but also with this conspiritual or conspiracy realm. And again, this is, these are things that are very difficult to talk about, and I'm not necessarily the kind of person that is just going to gaslight people that are trying to make sense of how powerful people conspire behind the scenes for nefarious purposes, but there's a sort of cons conspiracy epistemic is a way, is a term that I have 
which is a worldview that a person can adopt that I had for many years in my uh, early 20s uh, of making sense of world events always through the lens of conspiracy culture, right? Like nefarious Jewish cabals or the, you know, all of those things. So new age and conspiracy, they're now intertwined in this conspiritual uh, milieu. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, also the other streams that feed into it, which is kind of like the subjectivities of neoliberality, neoliberalism, particularly uh, identity politics, right? Like this hyper focus on identity as kind of like a main attribute of people and how we create our identities oftentimes inspired also. I mean, nowadays when you go into TikTok, for example, or even in Instagram and, you know, you see people that in their bios, right? It's not only the pronouns, but also kind of like their psychiatric diagnosis first and foremost, right? Mm -hmm. Like neurodiverse, autistic, bipolar, like that's kind of like what they lead with into the world as who they are, like how I present myself to the world. Well, I'm autistic or I'm neurodiverse. So, you know, I have depression or I'm having anxiety. It's kind of like a primary way of navigating social relationships is through my psychiatric diagnosis, like that diagnostic construct. Um, trauma being, of course, kind of like a primary part of it, right? Because as we all know now, everything can be traced back to original trauma. So trauma becomes kind of like that currency, mm -hmm. right? Like, well, you know, like this is who I am and this is what happened to me and these are all the traumas that I carry with me and hence, you know, I can speak about this thing or I can share about this thing and so on and so forth. So we have, um, you know, new age spirituality, this conspiracy culture, we have identity politics, we have hyper individualism, which is kind of like the maintenance of neoliberalism, this idea that the individual is the main unit, both of analysis, but also of experience, right? Like I think the best, the best, characterization of what that is was Margaret Thatcher's very famous dictum that uh, society is an abstraction, right? And all that exists are just individuals interacting with each other, which has become kind of like the, you know, I guess like the, the, the one of the main tenets of healing praxis, like everything is about the individual and the individual's responsibility and the individual's, um, you know, personal mm -hmm. process. I don't know if you remember, um, when you were down in Peru, but one of the one of the cliches that was repeated constantly by all facilitators when uh, new groups were being presented to what you know the work was like, and they were saying constantly, say like, uh, this is not a tripping center, this is a healing center, right, or something yeah. along those lines. Like ayahuasca is not for tripping, ayahuasca is for healing, hmm. right? So so the healing you know, the healing culture kind of like encapsulates all of these different ideas, not only of what psychedelics are for, or what ayahuasca is for, not nothing to do with the indigenous traditions, but rather with all of these different ideas, you know, what individuals are, you know, and yeah. so on and so forth in kind of like this era that we live in, this anthropocentric, anthropogenic, late stage capitalistic dystopian in many also different ways. Um, you know, there's all sorts of other uh, well, just influences. To, let me jump in there and just say, like, that's not actually true that ayahuasca isn't for tripping, it's for healing. Um, when I was at that other center I was talking about, which is very community focused, uh, non-commercial, the kind of place where it's like every Tuesday and Thursday night, they have ceremony and families will come down the river um, to go hang out and do a ceremony uh, because it's like something to do. It's a way right. to get together with community. I heard it called uh, like jungle television. Right. Um, so there's not such a intense focus on healing, but it's more of a communal experience that people have, which could be actually like fun and exciting. <laughs> like I mean, the camaraderie that we felt after ceremonies, like we would hang out and people would we had, you know share songs with each other. Right. Um, it was a, a beautiful communal enjoyable experience that wasn't focused so much on quote unquote healing and, yeah, and maybe I mean, but that maybe that is the healing thing like what you're pointing to before that there are these other factors that get lost in the hyper individualistic western approach to this kind of thing the other factors which actually are healing so yeah. having a, a community experience like that could be just the medicine that you need I'm absolutely convinced that that is true. I mean, from the perspective that I have today, I think like the vast majority of what benefits people is actually that experience of shared togetherness, the experience of connectedness, the experience of 
you know, and this is something that I have in interviews. A lot of people, for example, that were coming down to the jungle, um, you know, and one of the main attributes, I guess, that is very important to recognize when people are expressing, well, I've been depressed or I've been, you know, I've been dealing with anxiety for, I mean, nowadays we know, right, that one of the main contributing factors, and actually one of the central risks of to public health that has been identified in the latest years is loneliness. Something that hadn't really been on the radar of people, at least not researchers or practitioners that long. I remember one time, this is a story that I oftentimes tell, I was in a conference in England and I was reading a paper, like probably four years ago. Um, and I was reading a paper and he said something along the lines of, um, you know, Theresa May used to be the prime minister of the UK. Theresa May has appointed a member of her cabinet to be the minister for loneliness of the UK. And I read that and I thought it was very funny. Like, what the fuck does that minister for loneliness? <laughs> what is her job, actually? And then, you know, the more that I started digging into it, uh, the less funny it became. And I started realizing that actually almost all Western and Northern European governments had done something similar. Like they had appointed a, you know, a important member of their own kind of like parliaments or cabinets or whatever it was to tackle what they saw as a public epidemic, well, as a, an epidemic of loneliness that was sweeping over kind of like industrialized societies. Um, you know, since then, a lot has happened. Like, Loneliness is actually now kind of understood to be much, you know, one of the most important factors, not only for mental health, but also, you know, things like hypertension and also cardio cardiovascular disease and so on and so forth. Um, and many of the people that came, that you know, that come down to, to the retreat actually found, you know, those sharing circles, for example, to be some of the most important, valuable experiences they had. And talking to them, right, I started understanding why. These are people, right, who, you know, their 30s, 40s, 50s had never experienced what true reciprocity can be like, what true authenticity and vulnerability can be like, what happens when our suffering or struggles doesn't have to remain private, where we can actually connect with other people who can empathize with our suffering or what it is that we're going through in a non-judgmental manner, right? Like we can actually express those things and say like, hey, like these people are actually on my team. And they connect with my experience because even if we have different life experiences, there's certain things that are universal, right? Like the loneliness, the alienation, the depression. I mean, these are things that we can all kind of like sort of tap into. So, you know, those were incredibly important experiences for a lot of people. But then, you know, we get into the problem of, well, and now what? Right? Like when you're going back home. Yeah, and you're good going luck back... integrating that in exactly. Western society. Right, yeah. I had a glimpse. But again, all of, but all of the pressure is put on the individual to do their integration work. But exactly. like you said, what <laughs> what can offer the most benefit are things that are really hard to recreate back up in exactly. the north. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you know, people people have a glimpse, right, of what it feels like to be in community, what it yeah. feels like to to have like those relationships that are like you know to some extent really based on mutual responsibility. You have my back, I got your back. You can be vulnerable with me. You can express authentically, you know, like I, and you, know, you experience that very powerfully for 12 days or nine days or 21 days, but then you go back to Canada or the US or England, whatever you come from in societies where the social fabric is constantly unraveling and people are frustrated. Well, how do I replicate those conditions in my day-to-day -day life? And then, like you said, like that responsibility falls on them because the structures are not conducive to that, right? Like the the way that we live, the values, the orientations that we have as individuals in the societies do not prime us to seek those sorts of relationships. And then, you know, we have this problem of integration, which is kind of like one of the most absurd buzzwords, I think, in the psychedelic sphere, right? And, you know, tying back to what you started saying, trying to kind of branch it out into, but you know, when we when 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 you're doing ayahuasca within an actual indigenous community within the actual indigenous context, so the native context in which these things happen, right? The context is completely different to what we have grown accustomed to as a proper ceremonial context. But like one of the first things that you hear when you come to a center, most centers nowadays, like, uh, please stay on your mats, do not interact with each other, your experience is private, you have to respect each person's space. Even after the ceremony has ended, please keep your voice down. If you must talk, then go somewhere out there yeah. and try don't, to like not interact. Don't interfere with other people's process. Exactly. Don't interfere In, with, other with persons. their individual process. Exactly. And all of a sudden we've got the atomized individual in a yes. quasi communal setting. And it's like, 
what? <laughs> you don't want to disturb my internal experience. You don't want to mess with kind of like my constant rumination on the self, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, you, you don't, don't want to take me out of my rumination. Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, it's so, so different and so detached from like, you know, I, I was very surprised after, you know, after many months of doing that in the same way, like I would actually went and you know, did dietas with Shipibo healers and then uh, sitting in ceremony and there's chickens running around and <laughs> children crying and the healers come and go because shit is happening around. Like life doesn't stop, right? Because you're in a ceremony. Life keeps happening. Like yeah. conversations keep happening. Laughter keeps... One of the most incredible things, right? Even, even at the center, when the ceremony was ended and the facilitator very ceremoniously and you know kind of like self-congratulatory way announces the ceremony is now over oh, uh yeah. you know the first thing that happens all the shit people here start laughing and venting and talking and gossiping. that laughter yeah. gossiping right and yeah it happens throughout even though now Make, they're more making fun Yes. Of things that happen during ceremony, right? Making fun of all of us, like Western children, right? Like they, that's how they perceive us. They perceive us as immature children for the most part. Um, and, you know, nowadays they're, they're much better trained. They know like, hey, like you cannot really laugh at people that way. Or, you know, like, you shouldn't be laughing or talking or gossiping in ceremony because ceremony is sacred. You want to keep the container in this way that we have defined is the proper way of doing things. There's no chickens running around. There's no children crying. Um you know, it may, it may be disconcerting. The first time that I experienced it, I was like, why are there chickens Chickens here? Like, why are the children crying? Why are the babies in the maloca and not in the... But then, you know, there's kind of like this realization, like, oh, yeah, I mean, this is what an actual community is like. This is what a, an actual healthy environment where life doesn't stop because you have problems or you want to do a ceremony or you're paying somebody to provide a service for you. Um, and that, mm -hmm. you know, that's become integrated later. And I was like, ah, that actually was kind of like the key component of that thing, right? Like, that experience of togetherness of being cared for even in the midst of community chaos and so on and so forth which is so different than the way that we do it yeah i mean i guess one of the principles that i'm always trying to help people recover is simply not integration not necessarily wholeness or anything like that but naturalness yeah and that's one of the things that you have the opportunity to experience visiting a more intact culture that's outside of what we're used to in the North is to experience what naturalness is like uh, with the giggling, the gossiping, the, the poking fun at, all of that, the levity, the yeah. um, kind of chaotic nature of things, yeah. um, the lack of uh, kind of earnestness around uh, personal problems you know yes so you have that opportunity but then when it's put into this um kind of and i think i think of it as actually a kind of form of colonization when Absolutely. Uh, when westerners or northerners go down there they create a center they hire out the healing to uh you know indigenous or mestizo people uh, it's all a, a kind of a construct, a facsimile. Um, and what I saw that was kind of disturbing to me, well, not kind of disturbing, was is disturbing to me, is how uh, the kind of Western ideals were being imposed on Indigenous healers. Like you, you mentioned that they're actually, they're better trained now. So they're actually made to go through things like landmark forum type trainings, um, learning the language of trauma therapy and all of that. And I just think that's like, it's kind of like the last frontier of uh, modern colonialism. It, yeah, it's, it's really bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, were you, were you, were you there for some of the landmark training things or were you already out? Well, I was never really in, and right. I think, you know, because probably because I was already in my early 40s by the time I went down there. I had already um, had the bulk of my experience was in the Santo Daime um, church. Um, and just where I come from, um, you know, I come from like a working class background. If it's not practical, I don't have much time for it, you know, if it doesn't actually work. And, and that you know, that kind of uh, mindset right. has has affected my approach to yoga and all kinds of other things. There's like a practicality to it. 
Um, so I don't think I was ever in, and I did have some friction with the management there around certain things I would talk about, you know, that didn't support the narrative that they were trying to um, uphold there, you know, around what is ayahuasca, that it always has your best intentions at yeah. heart, that it's this uh, benevolent force, that it's a mothering force. Right. Um, you know, and I would say to people like straight up, like the jungle doesn't care about your well-being. The yeah. jungle wants to eat you alive, actually. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's a, it's a it's a really interesting thing how that became such a prominent narrative, right? Like the caring mother or the caring grandmother as the main archetype, when in reality everything else points out to the fact that <laughs> everything is there to destroy you in every way possible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, so if you go in with like a, even a little bit of... Uh a little bit of understanding about like Jungian archetypal psychology, you know, it stands out in high relief. What's going on there is that people are projecting the, the kind of good mother image onto yeah. ayahuasca. And, you know, when I see that uh, that's um, you know, propagated in a lot of these Western run centers, uh, you know, the mother, even the idea of it as the medicine, yeah um, kind of drives me crazy you know yeah it's nuts <laughs> i thought about it for a long time i mean even just the medicalization of that experience the psychologization of an experience that is you know fundamentally rooted in a completely different ontology like a worldview that has nothing to do whatsoever with kind of like the western um atomized worldview yeah it's like the so you have an advantage of speaking Spanish, right? So right. you could communicate more fluidly with the indigenous healers who, you know, a lot of them, their second language is Spanish. Some of them, their first language is Spanish. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, like, did you ever have conversations with them about what was going on there? Like, did you, you know, so one of the things that I always try to ask is, you know, things like, um, you know, what do you think the main problem with us gringos is? You know, they've they've kind of been at these centers and seen thousands of people come down from the yeah. north. Uh, so I'd ask, like, what do you think our main problem is? What do you think about this? Like, what do you think trauma is? Like, what's your understanding of that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, those are some of the things that I wanted to know from them. Um, did you ever ask those kind of questions to the healers? Oh yeah, I mean, I I spoke to them every day. I you know both for my own interests and personal relationships that I had. I had I had some really like good close relationships, like friend friendship relationship with some of the healers. I I lived there for a long time, and beyond that, I was also always curious as a researcher and you know part of my field work and gathering ethnograph ethnographic data, even though I didn't focus at all on the Shipibo as a object of study, like they were part of the container. Like my object of study was always other Westerners who were there doing their thing. I, I never felt comfortable having um, the indigenous as the main focus, but you know, they were definitely part of the container and I had really good relationships with them. And, you know, despite that, there was always some distance that was inevitable because of my positioning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I wasn't just a neutral observer. I was part of the organization that they worked for. So there was always a so lot they, of doubt. So they had to be careful about kind of towing, towing the company line when speaking with you. Yeah. And that's always, that's true for everybody. I think like anytime that they speak to a Westerner, anytime that they speak, whether that's a pasajero or um, staff member or somebody there, like there's always going to be distance unless for whatever reason, unless you're married into the family. And even then I really doubt that they're speaking their mind to the full extent. So, you know, I, 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 you know, for the most part, even though I did get, I did manage to get some really good information for the most part, there's always a caveat that they're always, almost always telling me what it is that I wanted to hear mm. uh, and what it is that was in their best interest as the employees, which is a very important thing. You know, like we tend to think, I mean, it's kind of like one of the fantasies that people have. Oh, like these people healers are so selfless and they're here to heal humanity and heal the world because they're on a special mission from the plants. And I'm like, fuck no, <laughs> they're employees and they're working here because it's good for them because they make money and they bring more clients to their own dieta centers. And the moment that that stops being beneficial for them, they, fuck the, they get the fuck out of there. Yeah. They don't have any selfless anything. They're businessmen and professionals as anybody else in the world, whether they're cheap people or not. Um, well, and often um, the healing work would be like a side hustle for them. Oh, definitely. You know, I, I remember one healer who I had a nice connection with. He was a school teacher in his hometown. Damian. Yeah, Damian. 
Mm -hmm. So when you ask them about, you know, um, you know, it, did you ever ask them like, is ayahuasca, do you see it as a mother figure? Um, what do you think about trauma? Do you call it the medicine? You know, those kind of questions. What, you know, with that, with your caveat in place, yeah. what, what kind of things did you hear? So, I mean, the, the, the general myth that many of them repeat, which I imagine it's been passed from, down from one to the other within that container, but also part of the kind of like the foundational myth of ayahuasca in the Shipibo traditions and other kind of like Pano-speaking Pano people around that area, you know, the Shipibo, Conibo, Ashaninka, and so on and so forth. Um, I mean, I'm not going to go through the whole myth, but it basically tells the story, right, where the father and the mother, uh, you know, had three children and then... The father dies and an ayahuasca vine sprouts from the body of the father. And then the mother dies and a, a chakruna bush, bush sprouts from the body of the mother. And then the three children come back to their ancestral home place and they find, you know, the ayahuasca vine in the place of their father and the chakruna bush in the place of their mother. And they combine them and they create this beautiful medicine called ayahuasca, which has been given to them by the Incas. Okay, listen to this. In the Shipibo story, as in many other Amazonian stories, particularly in this region of the Pano speaking people, ayahuasca was a gift that was given to the Amazonian people by the Andean people, the mythical Incas, in order to heal the traumas of colonization. So ayahuasca was born out of the necessity to heal from the violence of white people, right? Wow. So, but they combined, right? They combined the mother and then combined the, the father into this androgynous, non-gendered spirit, which is ayahuasca. So mm -hmm. in the Shipibo tradition, when you ask those questions, first and foremost, it's incomprehensible because they don't understand gender in the same way that modern liberals or modern people do. Um, but you know, this idea that ayahuasca is a feminine spirit, actually the ayahuasca vine is a masculine spirit. The chakruna is perceived as a feminine entity and the combination of both is what creates the world of the ayahuasca which by very definition, it's neither masculine or feminine, but either androgynous or a combination of both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it was the same in the Santo Daime tradition too. So it was surprising for me to, when I got into the, oh God, what do we call it? The more traditional type of ayahuasca ceremonies, you know, big quotes around traditional, yeah. but uh, it was surprising to me to hear this constant reference to ayahuasca as the mother, because yeah. again, in the Santo Daime, which, the exposure, um, the initial contact with ayahuasca was probably through the Yanomami up in the kind of northwest of uh, Brazil. Uh, but again, it was the vine carries the force, the masculine spirit, the leaf carries the light, the feminine right. spirit. Exactly. And it was always a union of the two, which was seen right. as a kind of a wholeness, which I think, well, that's beautiful because that's healing, right? Yeah. And that, that's in line with the yogic traditions and Tantra. the Taoist People traditions. And yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. So similar thing with the Shipibo. Um, what about the ideas around trauma? Were you ever to, able to get a kind of more honest answer about what they think of it? One of the one of the best things that I did down in the jungle was um the center where we worked has or had i don't know what the status is nowadays they had a non-profit association that did some sort of work socially and environmentally within the surroundings i mean very you... vague yes yeah but bringing in i think one of the things was bringing in um uh, indigenous students from the city to right. come well, work out in the forest. Yeah, right. So there's there's an association of uh, Amazonian indigenous students in, in the city of Iquitos, which is the city closest to the center where we were. Um, there's there's a you know relatively big university in Iquitos, the uh, University of the Peruvian Amazon, UNAP, Universidad Nacional de la Amazonía Peruana. And there were many students that came from all sorts of different places in the Amazon, right? From different, I think like by the time that I was there, there were probably 14 or 15 different nations or tribes represented within this association. Matze people, Ashaninka people, Shipibo people, mostly from the north part of Peru, not so much the Ucayali, the Shuar people, you know, all sorts of different uh, mm. tribes. And one of the programs that this organization had was helping them through their time in the university, right? Like indigenous people in the Amazon don't speak Spanish as the first language. For many of them, it's a second language or third language and they're not very proficient at it. 
Also, intercultural education in Peru is not great. So the, for the most part, they don't really have the same level of academics as their urban counterparts. They don't have the economic capacity. In short, you know, when indigenous students leave their villages, you know, across along the river banks of the Amazon, come to the big city, go to university, they face an insane amount of pressure. There's a lot of discrimination, right? Like racism is insane in Latin America, but particularly within rural mestizo communities, right? Like there's kind of like this colonial instilled Hangover. mindset, yeah. right? That, you know, you, 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 we, we may share the exact same genetic code, but I'm Christian and I'm civilized and you're an indigenous savage. So it's kind of like this insane detachment and racism towards- Or if, if people are um, of Spanish descent and have lighter skin, yeah. they can feel superior to the oh, darker yeah. skinned indigenous people. Yeah. 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 I mean, we have this kind of like this social hierarchy. This is true for most Latin America, but in Peru is very much like white people in Lima or Arequipa, and then kind of like the rural urban people in all the different, and then kind of like the indigenous people always at the end of the caste system in many ways. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, point is they, they face a lot of hardship. So, you know, one of the things that this organization that I was working with did is that uh, we would invite many of these indigenous students to the center actually to partake in ceremony. You know, you, you think about it it's like, oh, but well, it is a beautiful opportunity because you know we're providing kind of the ceremonial space and the work of the healers for all of these youth that come from nations and tribes where um, ayahuasca has been traditionally a big part of their culture. And then when you actually come to, to the to the meats and potatoes of what that interaction is like, you find out that 90% of the people that you're talking to are actually terrified. And they're like, why the fuck would I go and drink ayahuasca with white people nonetheless, right? And mm. then, you know, it's a really interesting phenomenon. I mean, there's also like intertwining phenomena, but we tend to think as Westerners, right? Like, you know, white people come to rainforest and we drink ayahuasca and we're like, oh, like, this is awesome. Like people in the Amazon might be delighted and this is part of their cultural, you know, patrimonio, right? Like the heritage and the reality is that ayahuasca is incredibly stigmatized within the rainforest and particularly within Amazonian societies. I mean, there has been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of uh, colonizing processes and evangelizing processes, whereas evangelization has been incredibly successful in all parts of the Amazon. There's very rarely any real true indigenous culture that hasn't been thoroughly evangelize right like yeah. every single a church a lot of syncretism yeah. you know you meet an indigenous healer you go look at his personal altar inevitably there's some catholic saints and jesus is on there along with you know maybe some uh some bones from a jaguar or <laughs> feathers from a toucan or something right you know? shipibo healers before ceremony were kind of like asked you know in a very subtle way to perhaps hide the cross the cross that they have because that's very confusing for the participants like why is it shipibo healer healer a christian right? be trigger triggering for some westerners right exactly um but yeah i mean the truth is that every single church you know both the the, the mormons and the adventists and everybody has like a very strong presence in the jungle and most indigenous or rural mestizo amazonian people belong and are very much into some sort of um christian or catholic religion so uh you know, one of the outshoots of that is throughout the centuries of evangelization that have also been very successful in in um, conveying this idea, right, that ayahuasca is demonic and that yeah. shamanism is the work of the devil and that the only true spirituality comes from Jesus and so on and so forth. So between that, right, and the, and the pressure for modernization, right, like this pressure that many young people in particular have, like, hey, like, we don't want to be perceived as backwards, indigenous, we want to go back, we want to go to the city, we want to go to university, we want to join the world, we want to have iPhones and be on TikTok and, you know, wear jeans and t-shirts, and we definitely don't want to be identified with anything like ayahuasca, because that's still seen as like, oh, like those primitive indigenous, ones. you know, between, mm -hmm. between re religion on one hand, and then the pressures of modernization on the other hand you know the vast majority of indigenous kids don't want anything to do with ayahuasca they're terribly afraid of it they think it's horrible and demonic and so on so things are shifting for many of them yeah i mean yeah. this is kind of like a, a snapshot of a particular time but things are changing yeah um so this whole story you know is kind of like to answer a point um 
I was very much involved with this project when we did invite like many indigenous uh, students to drink ayahuasca with us. And then, you know, as a good facilitator, then there's a proper way of doing things. And we gather before the ceremony and we share what our intentions are and how are we feeling. And we try to be as authentic and vulnerable as possible. And 99% of the times when we're talking with indigenous students, right? Like even if it's Spanish, it's like, a wall of silence right like yeah they well, don't know how to open up about themselves and share every gory detail of their life i, I it's think not it's normalized for them i think it's more than that i think they see it as a little bit obscene even like they see it as like yeah. why like why why are these people talking about themselves well it's incredibly invasive when right. um you enter into a situation where that's the expectation yes um yeah, I think it's a it's a big problem and a, and a real blind spot for a lot of people coming from right. uh, Western healing culture. No, oh, yeah, yeah. After we're like, like if, um, eye gazing, making eye contact, right? Um, talking about yourself in all personal detail. These right. are not normal in many cultures, and actually seen as forms of aggression. Of course. Yeah. Of, well, now of course you know, but just <laughs> yeah. How I mean, weird again, it, it seems to to other people. Like, I just want to highlight that for people listening. Like, how strange some of these things that have become normalized in very strange spiritual and healing circles is it, it, seen as very strange for other people. And I think you know that's part of kind of the universalist pretensions of the Western model, both of mental health but also of like individual subjectivity as a whole. Like, we expect like, oh, like this is the proper way of conducting one. So this is the proper way of creating intimacy, of being vulnerable, of having interpersonal relationships that are based on like that, like in, faked intimacy. You know, that doesn't make sense for other people. But on the other hand, and this is kind of like the point that I was getting to through the story. Um, you know, after a few of those sessions, I did get to have. Proper in the in the beginning, I was trying to interview them from a very kind of like researchy position, you know, putting my researcher hat and like, oh, like, hey, I want to do an interview with you. Can you tell me about your experience? And then, you know, three words, five words, just telling me what I wanted to hear and moving on. That was a complete failure. But then, you know, as time went by and I started realizing more kind of like my natural place within that environment, not so much as a researcher observing people, you know, through a magnifying lens, but actually nurturing interpersonal relationships creating kind of like more natural conversation then i did get some really interesting feedback from them and the thing that i think was the most interesting is that almost always when these indigenous students drank ayahuasca both their intentions but also their experiences and the interpretation of said experiences almost always had very little to do with themselves Right. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like, oh, like I'm suffering from this thing or I'm like run. They were almost always embedded within a much broader relational context. Almost always while well, it was extremely politicized because this is exactly the time in the Amazon rainforest where, you know, most of the indigenous associations were kind of like starting to be much more politically active in, re in claiming rights for the waterways and fighting the government for remediating the pollution in the main rivers that kind of like make up the geography, of the, you know? So, so they were saying like, um, you know, my intention for this, ceremony, this is like a couple of examples that I have actually registered in my, in my uh, notes, but you know, my intention for this ceremony is I want to see how my family is doing. Right. That's it. And then I was like, well, 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 what does that mean? You want to see how your family is doing? Like, can't you just call them on the phone and ask, like, what's up with you guys? And then, you know, as the conversation went on, like, oh, well, you know, this is a little more subtlety in it, right? Like, there's something happening with my community. There's something happening in my village. We're we're getting sick because the water is polluted. We're getting sick because the oil companies are encroaching more and more in our territory. I came to the city partly, right, because I wanted to come to university to become a lawyer, to gain the knowledge and the experience that I needed to be able to actually be of help to my community, right, by being part of the resistance against these things that are happening to us because of the oil company's exploitation, right? So the whole thing wasn't really about them. It was like, I want to gain more information about what it is that I can do for the benefit of my family and my community under these political circumstances. This is kind of like one example, but that's pretty much kind of like the narrative that many of these people have. It's not about me, my trauma, my process, my breakup, my things. Like, you know, show me what it is that I can do for the benefit of 
this thing that is very important, not only for me, but for everybody as a whole. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's a really great example and um, relates to something I've been talking about and how this intense focus on childhood trauma is the root cause of all your adult problems. Uh, infantilizes the adult, uh, keeps yeah. us kind of, you know, it constellates the child archetype and holds it up as a kind of deity uh, to be worshipped in a way. Yeah. Um, and what that leads to, my main argument against this approach is that it uh, ultimately depoliticizes the individual. And I think what you're uh, describing here is something that's in stark uh, contrast to that. Uh, and that could be very instructive for people. Um, but again, it comes from a place of feeling like you're embedded in an actual community and that you have responsibilities to that community and your personal well-being cannot be separated from the well-being of the community. So is there a way for us to, to go back to that? I think it's more something to be aware of as a pitfall, this uh, focus on individuality, um, and maybe start caring a little bit more about the um, little uh, plot of land that you find yourself on and the community that's in that. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if there's a way to reclaim that kind of more indigenous worldview and sense of self. Yeah. So, I mean, I think something that you and I share in common, at least the way that it seeps through your essays, um, is kind of like this knowing that we need better stories, right? Like, particularly when it comes to psychedelics or healing in a general sense, or therapy or mental health in kind of like the overarching thing, like we need better stories to tell each other about what that means and how to get there. The stories that we have now are utterly inadequate and in many situations also actually counterproductive, right? Like this, this process that you were describing actually has a good, very good term for it, um, neotenic societies, right? Like neotenic is kind of this biological process in which some life forms remain in their juvenile form instead of mutating or uh, metamorphosing into their adult, like the uh, asholotl, right? the Mexican asholotl, kind of like this little cute, um, salamander that lives underwater pink color everybody loves it that's really just kind of a juvenile salamander that never grows into the adult stage of actually being an amphibian that breeds out of the water wow there's different reasons for it right like yeah. the environment that they grow up in so on and so forth um but yeah i mean you know this this idea of the neotenic society this by design infantilization of people or at the very least you know keeping the population in a juvenile state for as yes. long as possible it's kind of like an inevitable, I don't know if a result or a prerequisite or both at the same time of the kind of consumerist mindset and lifestyle that we're accustomed to in post-industrial Western societies. Right? We, it requires from us that we remain in the juvenile state, that we're never really fully grown, fully responsible adults. Right? That there's always some other kind of like child childish desire or need or preoccupation that we can focus on, whether it means acquiring some good or some service or not thinking exactly about the issues one by one, but acquiring some ideological pack that has been served down to us through the grapevine and so on and so on. There's all sorts of different reasons. Yeah, so usually with the consistency of pablum, you know, uh, something that's soft and uh, easy to digest. It goes exactly. down smooth, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I totally agree that uh, it feeds capitalism, but also what it tends to do, and I think we're really seeing this uh, in high relief now, is the outsourcing of responsibility for self and community to bureaucracies and uh, neoliberal government, you know, the, yeah, the intrusion of government on personal lives and things like that. Um, like it's like always looking for an adult, whether that's the self-help guru or the the president, you know, you know what I'm trying to say? Right. Yeah. Yeah. We're looking for institutional answers um, in things that perhaps are best provided by intrinsic links of community, of personal relationships, of family. I mean, this is something that always blows my mind when... Um, I was in the, I mean, many of the things that we're talking about, for example, right, like the need for actual stronger relationships, for stronger communities, for more self-reliant 
uh, self-organizing groups of people as opposed to relying on something. These are both kind of like very anarchic principles, but also to some extent conservative ones in some ways, right? Like, like the emphasis on society as opposed to the individual, the emphasis on relationship and community, and to some extent institutions that are actually functioning and not just for the sake of institutionalizing power. Yeah, or, um, or it's self-perpetuating, right? You know, just keeping themselves going. But it, it's, it, it was one of the, one of the mind blowing things, for example, was uh, seeing a lot of North American liberals, right? We've kind of like the, the main demographics of the people. I mean, I haven't really done the full on study on this demographic part, but, you know, I would say for the most part, the majority of people who would attend a retreat in the Amazon rainforest tend to be part of that spectrum of like more liberal North American values, so on and so forth. Um, and then there's something really interesting happens because many of them also, you know, if they do decide to travel to the Amazon rainforest and, you know, drink ayahuasca with indigenous people, more often than not, they have an extremely um, romanticized idea of what it is that they're going to encounter. And this is, by the way, hugely, hugely because of the marketing that many of the centers do. Right, like we're working with traditional healers in a very authentic way, and this is like all the you know things that we're offering you. Every each person gets a personalized Icaro, and this is what an Icaro means, and so on and so forth. You know, a lot, a lot of people come looking for that highly um, romanticized fantasy of indigenous wisdom as something that is radically opposed to the values of kind of like Western liberal societies yeah. to some extent. Like, That's oh, like we're gonna. Point, yeah. We're gonna find like that nugget of like real wisdom that only pre-modern, pre-capitalist societies still hold with them. Uh, and then you know, there's some sort, some sort. Oftentimes, it's some sort of metaphysical fantasy, right? Like they have a special channel of communication with the beyond, or that that thing that we cannot fathom, or that thing that only they, through their training and tools and ayahuasca, have access to, and so on and so forth. And Oftentimes what happens is that actually, you know, when you spend enough time in the rainforest, or even if it's just like a conversation with a healer, you start realizing something interesting that actually indigenous wisdom oftentimes correlates with, you know, what, what, what we call traditional wisdom oftentimes actually correlates with traditional values. Right. And say like, yes. <laughs> well, actually, right. Like, you know, I mean, you may be liberal and you may be all of those things, but what they, what, what they, what the healer is saying oftentimes is like, Hey, like you need to get out of your fucking head. You need to start doing more for your community. You not just need to start being so self-absorbed and actually do something beyond yourself. Right. Like there's some, there's things that are more important than you, your community, your church, you know, so, having something that is, you know, the traditional values so in yeah. many different ways. Yeah, yeah, that's that's even beyond we get into I, like what actually. I love that though. I just want to highlight that that traditional wisdom uh, often <laughs> comes along with traditional values. Yeah, exactly. And so, don't be surprised if uh, you get something that um, might seem to your sensitivities as like uh, patriarchal or parochial. Uh, yeah, homophobic. Uh, oftentimes, homophobic. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, or just. Um, I don't know. It's a different worldview. You know, I don't okay. even want to put a, a phobia on it or anything like that. Or, a, you know, it's just a different way of uh, experiencing totally. and relating to the world. Yeah. So we were talking about uh, what you said. Traditional wisdom is often based in traditional values. Right. Yeah. I mean, that can be a little bit disconcerting for people who come with some sort of romanticized fantasy about enlightened beings as if you know, they were beyond these conceptualizations of patriarchy. And I mean, you know, even things like gender roles, you know, oftentimes you will find, uh, you know, women that come to the to the jungle and they perhaps, you know, more on the feminist side of the political spectrum and they don't really want to have families or children and they're very career oriented and so on and so forth. And, you know, when they... Um, get diagnosed by the Shipibo, mostly the, the female healers, like the first thing is like, well, I mean, of course you're unhappy. You're not a mother. You're not married. <laughs> like you're not fulfilling your your um, objective as a woman, you know, according to this idea that we have about 
very traditional gender role. And, you know, nowadays, that's something that you can't talk about within kind of like more, more liberal spheres, like, you know, the importance of action. Well, maybe maybe there is something about traditional gender roles that is worth considering because it has kept, you know, these kind of societies, you know, to some extent co coherent and functional and so on and so forth. But you know, I mean, I, that, that's not what I'm advocating, by the way. I don't, I'm not going to dig my toes into this. But maybe there's something to it in terms of, of uh, like life satisfaction, a sense Definitely. of meaning and purpose. Uh, and I think this is a big problem with um, kind of a postmodernist movement yes. is that uh, you deconstruct, deconstruct, deconstruct until there's no foundation left. And it's like, well, no wonder people feel anxious and uh, despairing and that there's a so-called meaning crisis and all this, like everything's been eroded down to nothing. Like even the atomized yes. individual is now being atomized in terms of turning into like a mist, into like a cloud of, of uh, nothing. And yeah. so, of course, that's not going to have a good effect on people's sense of well-being. And I think this is exactly one of the important points, right? Like if you're if you're living in the Amazon rainforest in small communities, dependent on agriculture and hunting and you know small scale craftsmanship to get by, then you don't really have the privilege to deconstruct all those different things. You need to survive. You need to, well, you know, you you, know, you need to work with what is. Like you're much well, you more need to... rooted in reality. You need to fulfill your role in your community, which often isn't of your choosing. There's a good term in Spanish, uh, decolonial literature, which I think is enraizado or territorializado. Yeah, and that what basically like these people, right? Like the people who live in the rainforest, in, in the indigenous of rural people, they're very much uh, territor territorialized. Right, like their subjectivities, their life experience is intrinsically intertwined with the land that they occupy. Yeah, they rizado, the... so it's made of the roots. Root of. Well, this is what uh, the word indigenous means. It means right. of the earth, not of the surface of the earth, but the chthonic earth, the, the roots. Yeah. They don't have the luxury of living in a hyper real postmodern reality that is made out of symbols. Luxury? Because... <laughs> luxury to live in hell? <laughs> Well, you know, yes, I get that. Yes. To choose your own adventure, you mean. Yeah. They can't really choose that, right? They yeah. have to live with the realities of their produce, the land, the political circumstances. They can't afford that kind of like, you know, very Western post-industrial hyper-real world of symbols that is deconstructed every day more and more and more and more, where we lose any sense of reference to actual embodied reality. They mm -hmm. can't, they can't afford that. They have to live there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, I mean, I know what you mean by calling it a luxury, but yeah. Well, I mean, a luxury in the sense of we we have choice if we want to. Yeah. I even wonder about that though, if it's turning out that maybe, yeah, of course it's a choice, but it's one that leads, you know, it, a choice made at your own peril. Like you also have the choice to jump off a cliff. Exactly. Um, yeah. <laughs> right. Not sure it's the wisest thing to do. Right. I mean, that's so interesting, though, that this uh, this kind of um, the interaction between traditional cultures that have and, and like the stark reality when that hits of uh, a lot of them holding tr very what we call traditional values, um, that not being a matter of uh, lack of uh, kind of evolution, but in it's intrinsic to their way of life. Like mm -hmm. it's not a choice. It's not something they need to grow out of, which is the kind of uh, colonial view of things. It's like, they're like, they're the ones who are suffering from arrested development and we need to help them evolve by bringing in um, a, a new evolved religion, like the latest and greatest uh Trauma, you know, trauma, trauma delic religion well you know first it was christian christian missionaries going down there bringing salvation now it's uh trauma therapists going down and bringing the salvation of uh you know mm -hmm. trauma therapy uh or landmark you know. coaches bringing the the salvation of ontology and personal purpose yes yeah they yeah man I mean, okay, so 
I wanted to talk to you about, you know, some of the, the dominant themes that you uh, identified in your time down in the jungle. We, I think we've covered that pretty well. Uh, some of the pitfalls. I mean, one of the things that I've heard you talk about is uh, spiritual narcissism. And I think that has to do with the hyper individual focus of, you know, healing culture and all that. Is there more that you want to say on that? Well, I mean, I think spiritual psychedelic narcissism or spiritual narcissism is an inevitable effect or an inevitable outcome of the hyper individualistic ethos combined with the sort of idea that we have about what doing the work means. That is always self referential, that is always self absorbed, that is always about me and my story and my narrative and my trauma and prioritizing always as a moral imperative the uncovering of said trauma. But if you're really serious about doing your work, right, you want to be peeling that onion for as long as it takes, as deep as it gets you, through every technique that you can find, whether that's landmark trainings or ayahuasca or therapy or whatever it takes. Well, it's going to take all of, the, all of the above, usually. Right. You know. Usually it's a, a kind of a, a buffet approach. It's like you want to take a little bit of everything, like whatever works, you know, to do yeah. the work. Mm -hmm. But then there's also the corollary of doing your work, because if you're not doing all of that, if you're not serious about doing the work, if you're not serious about digging into the roots of your trauma and drinking ayahuasca and doing landmark training and so on and so forth, then uh, you're spiritually bypassing. Mm -hmm. And nobody wants to be told that they're spiritually bypassing if you want to pretend that you're serious in doing your work. You're not right, or, doing the work. You're not doing the work. T, capital W, the exactly. work, whatever the that work. means. Okay, so here's something I want to ask you about. Uh, in your interviewing of um, participants to these retreats, did you ever ask them outright, like, what they think the end result of the work uh, looks like? Because this is something that I ask clients of mine. Like, what do you expect the outcome to be once you've, quote unquote, done the healing work? And I've got my own c conclusions about this, but I want to hear from you. Yeah, I mean, that's a, the excellent thing to ask. I didn't ask it back then. I think, you know, four or five years ago when I was doing these interviews, I had a different understanding of what you had kind an of assumption. questions. You had an assumption, maybe. Well, I had many assumptions. I had many assumptions, yes. And, you know, it's important to say, like, you know, I didn't arrive to this place that I mean now from the very beginning. It took me the many cynical, years. cynical, uh, critical point yeah. of view. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it was hard. It was hard earned. I mean, yeah, <laughs> you can't I, do I, it. I, I am cynical, but I'm also, you know, compassionate, and I try. I try to kind of navigate these things with a sense of, um, yeah, empathy. I guess. Well, but my yeah, I mean, my my theory about your um your meme page, which is very kind of meme mean and, and harsh in a lot of ways, is that it's a way to play out a lot of the the shadow of the healing culture. Yeah, and, exactly. Uh, give it a space, which can be cathartic for people i know it feels cathartic to me to have a laugh at some of these tropes and um, yeah. stereotypes for sure um so what do we expect from healing i mean what do you hear from people well i mean that's not a question that i would ask back then but that's definitely a question that i ask today and i mean i still do some of this work i still work in a retreat center even though it's a very different design of a retreat center that is not centered around plant medicine so it's a very different approach and a different range of things. And I am part of my job is to give workshops and talks precisely around these topics, right? So one of the first things that I would do is like provide a different um, idea or a different, uh, to offer a different idea of what being happy and healthy can mean when we actually do take into account the intrinsic links between individual society, individual culture and individual environment, right? So, you know, we're trying to deconstruct what does it actually mean to be happy and healthy? What is the, I mean, when we talk about healing, by the way, healing is an interesting word, right? Like healing mm -hmm. um, is cognitively related to the word, to the word whole. Healing and whole, they both come from the same root word. It's kind of like a proto-German word that means to bind things together or to put things together, right? Like the process of healing is very literally the process of becoming whole, mm -hmm. right? Of putting back together the fragments that have been, fragmented through whatever thing that happens so you know that's kind of like the leading thing like well if talking about healing what is it that it means for you to be whole right and then 
people will oftentimes, again, they have this incredibly hyper-individualistic idea of what it means for them to be whole. Oftentimes, these centers are on lifestyle choices, right? It's like, well, you know, being whole means that I'm healthy and I'm eating well and I'm exercising and I'm making the I'm making the right choices for myself exactly making yes. the right, not only making the right choice for myself and you know the most infuriating one I'm enforcing the right boundaries with others right like this word boundaries yes. like like I'm putting the right boundaries and I'm making choices that are good for myself which you know it sounds right right well yeah I mean sometimes we do need to put boundaries so we can make choices that are good for ourselves if we are in a relationship that is abusive or a narcissistic mother or these things okay but when that becomes a trope that everybody now is enforcing boundaries and keeping everybody else at bay and just having the right distance and the relationships that feel nourishing as opposed, I mean, this is not how relationships work. Okay? Yeah, want- well, because it, it, it's not allowing for tolerance and resilience and things that you conflict have, resolution. I mean, yeah, all which those you, things which you need to actually be in community exactly uh, for long for longer than twelve days. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, you know, this is no. kind of like also like part of consumerist culture, like this idea of planned obsolescence, I think is so ingrained in people's mind, right? Like we, t- we start to take the same approach also to relationships, right? Like, well, I don't know if I can fix oh. this. What so I just hear throw often, this. yeah, what I hear often from people, and this was a new one to me, but apparently this is a trope that's out there. Uh, I'm, I'm with them for a reason or a season. Right. So the planned obsolescence of any relationship. Built in. And, yeah, that, that was kind of shocking to me to hear that and to hear it come up uh, enough times that I realized it was a, an idea, a meme out there in the world. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so that's that's one idea is that it, when I'm healed, I'm going to start making better choices for myself. Um, right. One of the things that, you know, after just a little bit of inquiry with people, one of the things I find we get to, which is a hard thing for them to admit, is there's an assumption that when um, when I've done the work, I'll no longer be triggered by anything. Right. And I'll reach some sort of state of uh, kind of a detached calm that we see, that we project maybe, or that we see projected by some of the leaders of healing culture, right. which, uh, you know, I've been behind the scenes enough in the yoga world and in the plant medicine world I know that that's a persona that's cultivated in order Mm -hmm. to um, prop up their expertise or their authority and then to, um, you know, support the sale of their workshops and their programs and their books and all that. In other words, what you see up there on stage is the calm, detached, uh, non-traumatized, healed person is usually a complete fiction. uh, Yeah, it's a mask. A A persona in the Greek sense of the word. Yeah, but it's a it's a persona specifically cultivated to sell things to you. Yeah, yeah. it's a it's a business strategy. So that idea that um, basically when when I'm healed, I'm not going to be triggered anymore. I'm going to get rid of uh, all of these bad feelings or these emotional triggers that I have. That to me contradicts the the real meaning of wholeness, which would be to incorporate right. something into the whole. Uh, and so that's that's a problem, but I think people find that hard to admit. Well, I mean, the, you know, that the, the, like I just don't want to feel this anymore is really the thing they want to cry out. But right. uh, they're they're even ashamed of that. But that's something that's inherited from this healing culture. I think there's a there's a root assumption I think in healing culture that says uh, you have to own your triggers and any emotional response that you have is your own responsibility. Yeah. yeah, well, this is one of the things that comes up in the training with Gabor Mate, exactly. which is one of the, the big sticking points between me and him. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, the problem with this assertion, I mean, there's many problems with this assertion. But I think <laughs> one of the main problems with an assertion like that one, saying like, well, you have to own your triggers because your emotional responses are only your responsibility. I can see the appeal of that because it gives the, it puts the control back in your hands to some extent. So like, well, if I'm just if I just gaslight myself hard enough, Right. I can pretend right, that these responses really are just a matter of me growing and healing and you know, owning my triggers and figuring out what happened to me that I respond in a certain way when I'm faced with that particular situation. And that is kind of like the perfect, the perfect, perfect situation for kind of like this neoliberal consumerist capitalist culture, because it's basically kind of like continuing the same ethos that says, right, the only thing that exists is the individual. 
right? And anything else is an abstraction. If you have interpersonal conflict, if you're being oppressed, if you experience structural violence, right? <laughs> then there's no real value, okay, in looking outwards. There's no real value in being enraged. There's no real value in experiencing anger and wanting to change things outside because the only thing that matters is that you change things inside. Okay? that you understand yeah. that if you're being oppressed or if you're experiencing racism or sexism or just like somebody did something shitty to you, which is something that happens actually all the fucking time, the only thing that you have control over is how you react to it. So yeah. the only thing that you can work on is in your own reactions. So you don't have to mess with the world. You only have to look inwards. And that's yeah. pretty fucked up. It, it is very fucked up. And it's a lot of uh, pressure to put on the individual, thus increasing oh, yeah. their level of anxiety and uh, lack of self-worth and things like that, because it it's a project that inevitably fails. And I think it's designed to fail to keep you um, beholden to these experts who are always offering a new solution. Like uh, UG Krishnamurti used to say about the spiritual marketplace, if any of these answers that these guys are trying to sell to you worked, there would be no more problem, you know, and we've had, uh, you know, hundreds of years of people trying to sell you answers. So the other part of that, too, is the labeling of the other, um, you know, the triggering object to the subject is that, uh, you know, not only can you not change them, and you should only be responsible for yourself and all that, but they're also possibly a toxic person. And one of the um, healthy choices that you can make for yourself is to cut yourself off from that person. Um, yeah. And then thus further isolating the person, thus compounding the um, the loneliness, the, <laughs> the depression, the anxiety yeah. and all of it. I mean, it's just, it's like a, a really nasty kind of Ouroboros of pain and suffering. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I think we, we touched on this before, but, you know, I nowadays firmly believe, that's kind of like my belief, that 99% of the things that people come with as their problems or their suffering to retreats or to therapy or everything boils down of the depression, anxiety, like, like almost everything boils down to a fundamental experience of loneliness, of alienation, of the unraveling of social connectedness. And this yeah. is why the experiences that are the most powerful are actually experiences of real community, of real communitas, of really feeling like there's somebody else who can empathize and feel compassion and support us with real reciprocity and engage in mutual responsibility. Like those experiences tend to be the most powerful because that's exactly the thing that most people are, are missing and lacking and desperately needing to experience as a feature of their lives. Yeah, that social connectedness and, be, you know, expanding out of the social, like taking a broader definition of the social, right? Like the connectedness with the soul of the world, as you would say, or Hillman would say, uh, our nature connectedness, feeling not as an alien or a stranger in a strange land, but at home with ourselves, yeah. with other people, with the world that we have. It, these are the things that really matter. Yeah. Uh, What's well, been identified as nature deficit disorder. Right. I think, I mean, that's key. And that's one of the things people get a little taste of when they go on a retreat to any exactly um, beautiful, more natural place. Um, you know, like all of what uh, we're talking about here, I think I love the term that uh, Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor came up with, the modern malaise. Mm -hmm. You know, this is really the sickness of modernity. And in order to heal we may have to reject a lot of what modernity is offering. Yeah. And whew, that's a that's a big pill for a lot of people to swallow. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, for 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 me too. I mean, you know, I talk a lot about community and I talk about the importance of social connectedness and I talk about the importance of having like intimacy with various different not necessarily romantic or sexual, but you yeah. know, the kind of intimacy that elicits that vulnerable, authentic flow of things that you're really like embedded within, supported. You know, but you know, in reality, it's very difficult to achieve, at least, you know, for me, not only because of the context in which I live, but also because. You know, I'm already almost sporty. I already have my ways very much ingrained. I really value or I'm accustomed to valuing my time. I mean, I am self-centered. I am as selfish as any other Western person. I don't feel necessarily that I want to devote my life now to 
you know, doing things for others or creating community or relationship. And I, I, you know, to be honest, I wouldn't necessarily even know where to start, to start providing for myself and for others, that kind of container that I feel is so important for everybody. And I mean, I'm not saying that it's not going to happen or I'm not going to work for it. Right. But, you know, for me, for example, just the idea of going out and meeting people is already exhausting. Right. Because I'm so used to my solitude. I'm so used to like my particular way. And I mean, I do enjoy it and you know I like hanging out with friends and when I lived in the rainforest in Peru there was more enmeshment and so on and so forth but nowadays like when I you know if I have to be like very very honest with myself like my natural state gravitates towards solitude towards self-absorption towards like dissociation and checking out like I you know for the most part I would probably prefer like watching netflix any given evening that actually make an effort to build something with other people and so on and so forth like it's very 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 difficult to override all of these years of indoctrination into certain ways of being that for myself i see how difficult it is mm -hmm. yeah i mean it's uh it's a lot of work um but i think there are ways to mm, here's that word to integrate it into mm -hmm. a kind of normal uh, Western life, you know, these terms are, they fall short now because it's not just Western. It's become part of uh, a global culture. So yeah, uh, a modern um, urbanized life or something like that. Postmodern life, maybe um, one of the ways I think is just um, trying to reclaim some of the naturalness, like, so not making connections, such a, uh, such a big deal like not not turning it into like a program or a series of exercises that are approached with a lot of like earnestness um but finding ways just to uh kind of naturally connect with your neighbors and the people around you um yes you know, very simple things i think yes. can ha have a large effect and you know to not uh programatize it you know like we're going to connect so uh, we're going to sit down and gaze in each other's eyes for 20 minutes <laughs> and try not to judge each other. Right. Like, and then just offer up, uh, you know, uh, expressions of gratitude or praise, you know, it's, it's so phony and it's, um, I don't think it actually gives people the, what they're really looking for, which is yeah, just of course. a natural form of connection in easiness, like to be myself and like kind of let it all hang out words and all. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I get that. I think it's very important to, you know, work locally. And I think like, you know, it always starts kind of within the immediate spheres of one's life, you know, the like family, immediate family, neighbors, like friends, like start kind of like branching out from the core outwards. And, you know, this is something that I do realize. I mean, for me it has been fundamental and very instrumental, at least in the last two or three years since, um, you know, COVID kind of like really, helped me put things into perspective. You know, I was in the jungle, I got kind of caught in the jungle. Um, there was kind of like all sorts of things that happened. Eventually, I found myself in a new situation for the first <laughs> what time. What you're saying is like, it created a, a real shit show. Right. Because all of a sudden, these retreat centers that, re that rely on a steady stream of people coming from the north, cut off from that, and you guys are kind of stranded out in the jungle uh, right. with nothing to do. So did it turn into like a bit of a Lord of the Flies situation out there? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, you, you know, you're, you're describing, you're describing shamanic tourism or medical tourism, right? Which is kind of, you know, like any other tourism exactly relies on global mobility and airlines mm -hmm. and all those things. And, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I did, I'd spend, I spent some time, right? We spent some time stranded, but that, that wasn't necessarily what I was referring to. What I was referring to is like, you know, even after I left the jungle and kind of, it was kind of like an odyssey. I was airlifted out of Iquitos by the Peruvian Air Force and then the Mexican embassy rescued me out of Peru and so on and so forth. <laughs> but then I found wow. myself, I found myself in a situation where I didn't really know what to do, right? Like everything that I've known for the last four and a half years, my research, my, I mean, I was, I was meant to spend a year in London actually, uh, visiting as a as a visiting researcher at imperial college doing research there everything went to shit obviously because everything was closed down and i found myself in a situation that i hadn't really considered which is like well, what the fuck do i do now right like i what do i do like i don't have work i don't have research i i don't know i don't know where i don't know if, i don't even know where to go right the only thing that made sense was to come to mexico because this is where my family was um i haven't really lived close to my parents or my brother or my sister 
for 20 years. I mean, I guess ever since I was a teenager, ever since like, like I first left home and went to the army and then started like doing my life, like I hadn't really been close geographically to, I mean, we, we, we've always been very close as a family, mm. like emotionally. And, you know, we talk every day and so, and so forth, but I haven't really lived. And the first year, the first year and a half were kind of like that opportunity that, uh, you know, I, ch I chose to come to where my parents were, my parents were, and my sister and my niece, and everybody was there. And it was kind of like that, um, I, that realization that if this time was worth something was to really nurture those relationships, right? Like mm -hmm. getting closer with my father, getting closer with my mom, getting closer with my niece. Like there was nothing really anything else that I could do anyway, but there was nothing else that was as important as that. Like that realization that relationships were the primary thing that were important for me, not only as a person, but like really in events like that one, right? When, you know, when 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 shit collapses, like the only thing that is going to give us that lifeline is each other. Like we we're gonna have to like rely on collaboration, on reciprocity, on mutual responsibility, on having networks of people that can lend a hand when everything else fails. So, you know, yeah, that was kind of like, well, a, that was a waking up call. Yes, I'm with you. And, you know, as soon as uh, COVID hit, we were in Mexico City, um, coincidentally. And the day we got back was like the same day they shut down the airports and all of that. At the time, we were living in Montreal, thousands of kilometers away from um, my immediate family, my brother and nephews and mom and dad. Mm. And we ended up, uh, once they started to lock everything down, we saw what the implications of that would be, kind of being stuck in the city. Um, we moved back to the West Coast to be close with them for the first time in a while. And like you said, it was a realization that when everything else goes to shit, what do you have to rely on? Um, and fundamentally, you know, it, it's often family, uh, and family, you know, maybe your family's not involved in doing the work, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, and like you know, that, that old Ram Dass quote that gets trotted out all the time. It's like, you think you're enlightened? Well, go spend a week with your family, right? Yeah. Like you think you're integrated and healed. All right, we'll test it out. And I, I think what the signs of more integration and healing is, is a greater level of tolerance uh, for other people. And um, like I said before, like a resilience, like being able to go in there and have all those old triggers come up and um, kind of see it through, like stick around, you know, don't cut them off. Don't expect them to change. Um, maybe being able to, to voice, uh, you know, things that, may not be agreeable to you or, or optimal for the relationship and things like that. Like, like you said, conflict resolution, like the ability to be in council, to work, work through conflict together and not uh, just cut ourselves off from things that are uh, perceived as problematic or toxic. You know, that to and me is the real sign of the healing. And that, that's like a really the, a, a growth in your capacity. Maybe yes. is a way to think of it. Right. And I think that's kind of like a very fitting way of bringing everything around together because we were speaking before of kind of like the colonization of Amazonian ways of working with ayahuasca and kind of like we're bringing our own ontology of what ayahuasca is for and kind of like imposing that on Amazonian healers because they need to get paid and they need to adapt to the way that we want to work with their medicines and so on and so forth. Um, but, you know, when we talk about kind of what are actually are the traditional ways in which ayahuasca is used and has been used in many indigenous environments and indigenous contexts for you know so long, then actually conflict resolution resolution is one of the main ones, right? And that still is a primary orientation in many, in, uh, both kind of like Peruvian ayahuasca. Nowadays, I think I know these examples more from kind of like Colombian yaje traditions, where yaje is specifically used to mediate conflict oftentimes for example not only within members of the communities but you know with the Cofan and the Inga and all the different southern Colombian tribes that are often in conflict with oil companies oftentimes ayahuasca would be used to mediate between oil representatives and indigenous representatives or at least that's the intention or at the very least as a way to bring coherence to a community so they can actually make a voice in a, a decision that is one voice and say like this is the resolution that the community has in relation to this political thing right so actually conflict resolution has and still is one of the primary things that ayahuasca is used for 
in indigenous context and in a general sense right the social coherence part the relational aspect of ayahuasca still is and will forever be a primary thing of what ayahuasca uses that is so in stark contrast with the hyper individualistic everybody in their own mat everybody in their own thing don't bother each other like keep personal space kind of like way of doing things um, in many mm -hmm. of the western models that's great and <laughs> I can see how um, that would work really well in conflict resolution because so much of conflict is interpersonal conflict. Right. Uh, too much fixation by the individual on their personal needs and desires, and that's in conflict with someone else's sense of personal needs and desires. So how do we find a common ground here? Well, how about we try to get out of ourselves through an ecstatic practice, whether it's ayahuasca or dancing and singing together, uh, rebuilding a sense of communitas, which yes. uh, is a collection of non-self-centered individuals working for a greater purpose, perhaps, right. uh, reinvigorating that. Um, and none of that involves me looking at my childhood trauma to, for, to, to find the source of my triggers so that I can get rid of the triggers and I can experience more peace in my life. Like, right. Yeah, and I mean, none, none of that can happen if the primary orientation that we have as a, as a default is like, oh, like this person hurt me, so they're toxic, right? Or, you know, this yeah. person hurt me, so they're a narcissist. And it is kind of like- Or this person hurt, hurt me because I'm traumatized and I need to work on my trauma. Right. Yeah, so I mean, either one of those kind of like cultural tropes, right? Like the, the, the self-reference of like, you know, I have to work on my triggers or, you know, boundaries or, you know, this person is toxic, that person is a narcissist. So we need to completely cut them out as opposed to finding common ground and finding resolution and then expanding outwards into like, oh, like that person, you know, did some uh, damage. So they need to be completely ostracized from the community. Like all of those things are kind of like results of similar approaches or similar ways of doing things that are opposed diametrically perhaps to this other idea, which is like, actually, you know, conflict is an intrinsic aspect of relationships and something that needs to be learned how to navigate that more wisely so we can actually keep the community while there's conflict, just navigating that more closely so we can all learn something from it. Well, and so we can survive in a lot right. of cases. Like like you said, it's not right. actually a choice for them to splinter apart and go their own way and all of that, right? Right. I mean, that's kind of, you know, maybe this is a good good way to to close this. But, you know, again, like, this this idea, for example, of um, Aini, right? Like they're in the in the in the Andean traditions, right? Like there's 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 this idea of Aini, which is embedded with this larger philosophy, the Sumac Kausai, the, the in, in, in Quechua that translates into the good life, which has been kind of like the philosophical edifice upon which Andean culture and by default then also. Uh, many lowland cultures kind of like originated because they were built upon certain ideas or certain precepts that come from the original idea that, you know, the Quechua, the um, Andean civilizations were built upon, which is radical collaboration. And this idea of Aini, right, which roughly translates to reciprocity. But, you know, um, exactly like you said, like people very early on realized in the high mountains, right, because of the environmental characteristics of living in the high Andes, they said like, well, if you we want to survive, I mean, if you want to thrive, but if you want to survive, like we have to adopt a model of co-living that relies on this idea that we can count on each other when things go difficult, right? So, you know, they, they kind of like, they institutionalize this idea of Aini as a moral orientation, as like a primary, you know, moral imperative that we're here to help each other, right? So if one village one year, for whatever reason, they didn't have enough quinoa, then they could rely on the potatoes of the other village. And that was institutionalized within the empire that was built forever, right? Was it, that, okay, so a more nuanced understanding of Aini, uh, reciprocity, doesn't it mean something like I give today so I may receive tomorrow or something like that? Exactly, yeah. yes. Yeah. So it's this very ingrained idea that permeates Andean thought and then also Amazonian thought, right? Which is like, nobody is independent, really, because we all rely on each other at some point, right? There is this other idea of interdependence, which is we're, mm. we're neither we're neither codependent or dependent. We're also not independent. We're all interdependent and we need each other to really thrive and survive. So we need to take care, right, of each other. And that kind of like, you know, branches out into each other crops and each other things and so on and so forth. But interdependence is very much as a 
basic moral understanding and metaphysical understanding of what life entails, not only within humans, also within you know non-humans. I mean, we can I mean, another day talk more about the actual yeah, yeah. medical system, the Amazon, which is built upon that idea, right? Of like, well, nobody gets sick just because they get sick. They get sick because we're all intertwined into this network of different actors that hold grudges and you know and so on and so forth <laughs> but you know like this idea that we're all actually interdependent as opposed to like this more libertarian western idea of independence and radical self-reliance which is you know in the greatest scheme of things absurd when you put that into the proper context of a globalized village and all of the different things that it takes to actually thrive or survive yeah you know it was a great hope of mine and i think others that the COVID pandemic was going to bring about a reevaluation of our fundamental values. And I don't think it was strong enough, actually. I think that uh, kind of modern non-culture is resilient enough. You know, individualism has got enough support now that we didn't have to rely on uh, Ine reciprocity, recognizing interdependence and all of that. I think something's got to get even worse before we can really start to um, uphold those kind of values again. Unfortunately, but I think that's what's coming actually with now all of the kind of economic impacts and everything that we're seeing and experiencing. Um, it's getting harder and harder to be an isolated individual out there just trying to make it in the world by yourself, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think we got to wake up to this sooner than later. So I think this has been a great conversation and I, I really appreciate the chance to uh, get to speak with you like peer to peer um, talking about our experience in the healing world and um, how we've kind of, our understanding has evolved over time and to find a, a real uh, resonance in, in where we're at now and what we're trying to put out there in different ways. And I mean, yeah. I've thought about creating a kind of shadow account where I could just post all of my like mean little jokes about uh, what, what, I've, what I've seen in the kind of healing world. Uh, uh, I never went, got around to it for my own reasons, but I, I kind of like that you've done it. You've put it out there. Um, hopefully, what my hope for that is that it doesn't uh, just kind of feed people's inner cynicism, but allows them to to laugh at themselves, actually. Exactly. To laugh at themselves, to give them enough distance uh, to disidentify with um, being a you know a person on their healing journey alone, uh, and maybe start to look at like other alternatives, other narratives. That that's my hope for yeah. it. But I know a lot of people are just going to come and get the yummy little, um, you know, uh, cynical, uh, tasty treats. You know, like the the inner cynic is getting well fed through that. And but I hope that people. Yeah can just have a laugh at themselves and um, consider some other alternatives. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that, you know, I think, I guess that was also like one of my concerns that perhaps I'm just catering to a crowd of cynics and, you know, kind of like people that really are there just for the, for the mean takes on things that they already didn't, but that's, that's actually not what I'm seeing. I think like the, the, the vast majority, I mean, there's definitely some, followers that are kind of within that category but you know i think like 80 85 percent of the people that follow that account and engage with that account are actually the people that i'm constantly making fun of there's life coaches and there's star seeds and there's you know like like yoga teachers and like influencers and i think you know there's 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 the, the vast the vast majority of people that engage with that account are actually the people that i i, I am hoping through the humorous approach are actually going to be able to see tiny reflections of themselves mirror in some ways that they can actually they, they can actually can land in a way that is not creating antagonism or creating more distance but actually like oh like i recognize that absurdity within myself and actually there's a point here i can laugh at it because i see it and there's something mm -hmm. in this for me to learn and i think like actually that that is the vast majority of people and that makes me happy because if i was just scaring to a crowd of cynics like myself then that would be pretty boring and pretty pointless 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you are out there still engaged in helping people with their healing right. process. Healing is a real thing. And I will never throw away that term. Uh, exactly. Even if one of my heroes, James Hillman, uh, hates it. Uh, yeah. I think, I think it's a real thing if we understand it to be wholeness and that that includes um, uh, tolerance and, and uh, love for others and all of yeah. that. Um, yeah, great. Well, you're still out there and you're trying to do things differently at yeah. the retreat center you're working at and in the individual work that you're doing. So yeah. if people want to learn more about all these things that you're doing, they can go to healingfromhealing.com and of course find the Instagram page and get a little catharsis, maybe um, have a little chuckle at themselves and the yeah. ridiculousness of the modern healing marketplace. So yeah, it's exactly. good to reconnect with you, man. Yeah, likewise. It's been a pleasure. All right. Well, we'll be in touch. Yes. Ciao. Bye. Adios. <laughs> Hello. Hello.